Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you. Coming up on DTNS, spoiler alert, we reveal everything that's going to happen in tech in the year 2023. We're just going to tell you it all right now. We're not going to possibly be wrong. <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News Show for Friday, December 30th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From New York City, I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us to spoil everything that's going to happen in 2023, data scientist, comedian, circus performer, and host of Majoring in Everything, Andrea Jones-Roy. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to be here. Good to predict the future. I'm glad the data can tell you exactly what the future... It can tell us everything. <laughs> as, we, as we well know. Uh, also, co-host of Brad and Will Made a Tech Pod, Will Smith. Welcome back. I'm here with all the very serious future predictions, as you can tell. Yes, uh, the the prediction that Will is making with his with his accoutrement is that we will all wear light up reindeer horns. Look, we need more rings in our lives. That's like we need hoops. <laughs> Where's the future? It's the 21st century. We should all be wearing like rings around our heads. They should float. They should spin. They should be all lit up. It and kind of is like a slight Donnie Durko vibe, but I like it. <laughs> I will then redon my top hat. Oh, it's so, so good, it Tom. Is. Yeah. <laughs> I am entirely unadorned, though I do have a huge pile of circus costumes just down here to my right. I could have put them on for the. I for mean, the you could, yeah, you could totally just outdo all of us in a heartbeat, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. It depends right. on your your appetite for sequins, but yeah. <laughs> Insatiable is how I would right. describe our appetite. <laughs> for sequins here on December 30th, just days away from uh, sequin filled New Year's Eve, I would expect. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, Sarah Lane. Yes. You get the distinct honor of starting us off with what is going to happen in 2023 in the world of technology. What do you think is going to happen? The okay. first of your predictions. Okay. So, all right. So I've thought a lot about this and obviously as of late, um, the Twitter, uh, uh, circus, uh, that it is, um, is its own thing, but going off of Twitter for a second, uh, thinking, okay, well, you know, where do we all want to talk? Uh, in the future. Let's just say that, you know, we have other options but besides Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus, haha. And I, I've, I've, I've been uh, really interested in testing out the waters of all of those alternatives. And I think that Mastodon has gotten the most attention uh, recently because well, for variety of reasons, but uh, decentralization is one of them, but also just a kind of like, it kind of seems like Twitter, but it's better than Twitter in these uh, variety of ways. And having spent a lot of time on Mastodon, I'm going to predict, and it's not because I want this to happen, but it's because I think that it just isn't going to stick. I think Ooh. I think it is it is something that people are enthusiastic about the idea of Twitter being a a version of Twitter where there is no you know one uh, person in charge or you know a company in charge is is very attractive and that said um, and I'm among these people many people who live and work in tech and understand how this all works kind of keep going. Yeah, but is it? Is this really the future? I don't know. I want it to be. And yet, my prediction is that I think it's not going to work. Okay, but I'm going to push you a little bit. How, what does that mean, not going to work? Does that mean like it I think fades people, and, and people aren't going to be using it the way they are now? Yeah, or, I, yeah. I feel like it's going to, let's say, let's call it six months from now, in 2023. I don't think Mastodon is going to be a thing. Uh, and you know, like I said, I, I would like that to be, uh, not to be the case. I just, I feel like there are too many folks saying to me, uh, too many folks who know exactly how it works and why it works and why it's good to be like, but where is everybody? It's, you know, it, it's too deregulated and people are all over the place and, you know, maybe they have our other options. I just don't see it. I don't see it being the new social network. 
So to to be clear, you're not saying it, it disappears. You're just saying it goes back to being a niche thing. I just don't. Yeah, I don't think it becomes the like. Oh, remember when we all used Twitter and now we all use Mastodon? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just don't see that. Yeah. And you know, call me crazy. I might be wrong. Have been before. We'll I be only again. call you Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of where I am on this. All right. Thoughts on Sarah's prediction? Mastodon fades back into its earlier form as a as a fun but niche sort of place for people i mean it, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting like i think it oddly how mastodon does depends on what happens with twitter right because if 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 elon musk is yeeted from twitter tomorrow and and you know jack dorsey comes back riding on in in some sort of enormous horse or something and, and saves the day then <laughs> which maybe... i don't think will happen either no, right. i think it'll be a perfectly normal sure. size horse yeah i mean he's not gonna bring a sink we know that okay big horses are expensive and they don't have the budget we know that that's right yeah but yeah if like if twitter becomes a hospitable place for people to do their brand engagement and their marketing and and all the things that we use twitter for and and talking about what we had for lunch then i think sarah's probably absolutely right if twitter remains a, you know a toxic hell stew then then all bets are off and uh, i don't know well and i think it will remain a toxic hell stew my point is that i don't think that mastodon is where everybody goes after this it could be they go somewhere else something that hasn't even launched yet maybe exactly. it's blue or maybe it's something totally different yeah yeah and there are other options now and i think people are you know kind of just you know testing the waters plurk and it, it could be plurk google plus I gotta go where you at yeah yeah no but, i uh, think yeah yeah, Sarah, I think you're right. I have my doubts that Mastodon is going to take over as the thing. And I think I think it maybe has less to do with what happens with Twitter because I think there is no going back to the old Twitter and it's not that the old Twitter was it was perfect either. And so I think there's going to just be a lot of shifts. I think it's going to be much more of a, a random slash our elite, particular elites, vocal people going to move to one or the other. And I don't hear anyone who's like a big mover going to Mastodon in a way that's more so than Post or, or wherever else. So I think it's going to be much more of a human driven kind of collective action problem that's going to get in Mastodon's way. And it's going to be less reliant on what's going on with Twitter. But I agree with you that I don't think it's going to be the one. I mean, it could be that we all just kind of migrate to Instagram where a lot of people are anyway. Or Tumblr. I think Tumblr is an underdog here. Tumblr. Yeah. 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 Yes, it's definitely an underdog. I think that's that's fair <laughs> for every year to say. I'm, I'm on not team spending MySpace a prediction myself. on that, but I think people under underestimate what it's up to. Uh, I, did yeah, any of you, any, were you big Tumblrers? I've been posting I more was. to Tumblr lately. I used to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not lately. But, and it's run know. by Matt Mullenweg, who runs WordPress. WordPress. He Hero mm. of the internet. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah I, I tumbled know. a bit back in the day, but I never really used it it was just a microphone for myself i has any last thoughts before we move yeah. to sarah's second prediction sure if, if mastodon was as easy to use as twitter i think people would be on top mm -hmm. of it and that was mm -hmm. one of the, the the hardest things about mastodon was explaining how exactly do i use this because yeah. twitter was There's so a dead barrier easy. To entry. right and that's i think unless something changes or somebody else decides to roll their own server and that one becomes like the most popular one i think i'm gonna tend to agree with sarah that mastodon won't replace twitter i think uh, Andrea was right as well with Twitter's, the old Twitter's gone. So mm. we'll see what else pops up. It might be something, maybe you'll make it at home right now. You're not doing anything. You do. Yeah. New Year's resolution for you, the listener, right now. Um, which makes me think of Twitter Blue, too. Could do, like, fix what Mastodon and, you know. It won't. That's what, yeah. <laughs> maybe will, maybe it won't. Yeah. Uh, what's your second prediction, Sarah? Okay, so my second prediction has nothing to do with Twitter. Sigh of relief from everybody. Um, however, we have heard uh, I, over the last month or so, you know, a lot of a lot of rumblings about what is going on in the um, the the uh, the smart home. You know, uh, uh, the voice smart assistants, voice assistants. Kind of thank yeah. you, thank you. Mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm. um, which uh, Amazon's assistant. I will not say her name, but we all know who we're talking about. But that is not the only one. There's obviously, uh, you know, Google Home and uh, Bixby, and you know, Bixby. however many others. I know, haha, -ha, Bixby. But um, what I what I do, I wonder about, and this is actually something that's going to affect my life because 
pretty much my entire home is a smart home where I tell it audibly to do all the things, you know, turn my TV on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, make my light, you know, over on that particular dresser 50% rather than 100%, you know. Um, I have lots of, uh, lo lots of, uh, 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 routines uh, routines yeah thank you tom you it's like you're reading my mind um of of th that i've been going through over the last few years and i'm so into it uh you know smart lights are just one part of it but you can really get deep into it if you want to so when i had heard that at least uh you know if you're just talking about amazon specifically that you know there's yeah, there might have been you know some they had spent a little bit too much money in that arena and they're going to cut back and maybe they don't really know what the assistant is super good for over time that gave me some pause and uh i don't really know what that means if nothing gets better than it is right now my life doesn't get worse. <laughs> I want to talk to my television. I want to talk to my uh, my microwave, which I do. I want to talk to my fridge. I want to talk to my uh, certain lights in my bathroom. All is fine. But if it doesn't get any more complex than this, I'm not sure that anybody who isn't an enthusiast the way that I am right now is going to get into this. And I think that that's what a company like Amazon or a company like Google, et cetera, et cetera, are worried about. And uh, because some of the big tech companies have been cutting back on a lot of employees as of late, uh, it seems that this is an area where they are not totally sure where they go from there either. And I wonder if we're gonna have kind of a hard time with, with voice assistance going forward. So how do we tell if you're right or not? Is, is it outages? Is it just declining market share? They stop introducing products? I uh, Yeah, I, I, I guess we would say that I'm right if it doesn't advance in any way beyond right now. Got it. So if it's pretty much exactly because where I it think, is now or worse. Yeah. Because I think if you, if you cut, let's say you cut 10% of your work staff that's in that arena, probably the way that voice assistants work right now, you know, it's already been established, but it's not going to evolve. So that's my prediction. No evolving of Amazon voice assistants. What do we think? I mean, I think you've just given the best case for smart home devices that I've ever heard. I don't talk to anything in my house. <laughs> and now I feel like I wish I did. And I so I don't know. I'm, I might now have been propelled to go against your prediction and put all my uh, energy into <laughs> buying it. Sarah's Amazon. prediction I want, causes I want Andrea you to, to single-handedly right, save the yeah. Amazon yeah. voice assistant. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're causing our predictions to materialize. No, I think that you're right. And I, where I thought you were going to go with this when you first opened up is it was going to go away because we, why, why do we have these? Well, I'm thinking of the the physical cylinders and the discs and the stuff that you put on your counter, but it's like. What, why do we have a separate thing for it? I'm sure I could just use my phone to talk to all my devices. And, and maybe that still counts as those devices if it's all centralized in one thing. I thought you were going to say it's going to go away because we're just all going to be doing it from our phones and we don't need to buy like a certain brand of fridge or a certain brand of whatever. Like well, it's all I, think go that, I think that's probably part of it. There is yeah. probably some hardware uh, th that just uh, people don't want to buy anymore because you can right. do exactly what you're talking about, Andrea. Right. But but I think it's it's more of the like, okay, well, sure, smart home stuff, you know, smart light bulbs, smart uh, various devices. We've got matter coming out, like the, the world is our oyster. But at the same time, it seems like a lot of these companies are like, eh, we put a lot of R&D into this and, you know, the people who care about it already care about it. And maybe the people who don't aren't gonna get on board. Mm -hmm. Th this is the classic thing, though. You, companies spend billions of dollars building out this technology. They get to the end. They have something that works and is kind of compelling to a niche or enthusiast market. And then they pull the rug out from under it right around the time it starts to get interesting to normal human beings. And it looks like Alexa, like Amazon's going to do that with Alexa. They they said they were going to spend less money on Alexa next year. They they um they did some writing down, I, is my understanding. Yeah. And I think it leaves an opportunity for Apple and, and Google and the other people that are in that space, including some of the open source alternatives for that, for that, you know, the voice, the voice assistant market. 
I'm curious with Matter coming out, but it being a real thing, having a lot more devices working, making sure that smart home devices get to more and more homes. Now you have a lot more data points. So if Amazon is going to keep around its voice assistant, they can collect a lot more data than they previously could because it was an enthusiast product. I talk to everything in my home anyway, whether it's smart or not. So the thing is, <laughs> these these things are going to get smarter. I'm going to actually, I disagree with Sarah on this. I don't think that I don't think it's going to stop. We're not going to get in a stasis. We might lose some of the the hangers on, like like the Bixby's, and maybe even Siri if Apple decides to really do something with that thing. I'm still not sure what they're doing with that. But I think between Google, Amazon, machine learning, and Matter, there's going to be so much more data points and a lot more homes that are going to have this stuff that we're going to see an evolution next year. Not an official yeah. pick. I I think that. Those stories about Amazon were overblown because people really wanted to fit a narrative they have about big tech uh, and that it was very simply Amazon shifting strategy and saying, we're not making the money off retail, we thought with these, so we need to retrench and move it into a smart home. That may make Sarah right this year as they make that transition, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's Bit not of a long game, though. It's not necessarily going to disprove, but it's to me, it's less about like, oh, they don't know what to do with it, and they're giving up. It's more about, oh, we thought we could drive retail sales, and we're not. But like what I has pointed out, there's matter, and there's this other stuff. Let's let's rework it and, and figure it out there. All right, good predictions, Sarah, Andrea. Let's move to you. What's your first prediction for 2023? Let's go. So I have been thinking a lot about, as many people have, about chat GPT. And frankly, Sarah, in our conversation about smart everything, I was like, well, we're only going to get better at talking to machines or they're only going to get better at talking to us. So so it may even play a role there. But I, I'm a professor. And so when chat GPT first came out, I was one of many, many thousands of faculty all around the world who said, oh my gosh, our ability to do traditional assignments has gone out the window. And I don't normally do essay-based assignments, but I do do, you know, answer with a paragraph and do some code and then talk about that. And it can do all of those things. Not so well and not so perfect and all of that, but it's enough that it can fundamentally change how assignments are being done. And I, I assign research papers for my college seniors where there is a fair amount of writing. We have to pose the question and give a lit review. And most of all, if we're thinking about college, we're thinking about things like the college admissions essay, where you write about what, you know, am amazing, profound time you had in your life and why that makes you perfect for Tulane University or whatever. And so I joined the panic of professors who were like, this is all going to go out the window. And I've been thinking about it and I've been reading about it. And the I have decided that I'm gonna be slightly more optimistic than I normally am. And I think that while indeed ChatGPT is gonna require us to be more careful about the types of papers that we assign, the types of writing that we ask of students, and the types of writing that we read and, and ask of anyone, not just college students, while that's gonna be a serious you know, wrinkle in how we do things, and I think a welcome maybe uh, initiative to change, I think the good news is that all of this stuff, all this interest in natural language processing and, and text and, and literature and intersections of, of all of this, you know, we could have ChatGPT write movie scripts. I think it's gonna be awesome for the humanities and by extension, the social sciences, because it's gonna actually require people who would otherwise maybe just be hyper-focused for whatever personal intrinsic or extrinsic reason on data science, computer science, engineering. You're gonna be forced to have to study things related to language, linguistics, history, maybe you want to use chat, chat GPT to generate a movie script, you're probably going to want to take a film class. And so I've decided, you know, even in my own course where I teach natural language processing, we can't do it without understanding how you divide up language and, and whether grammar means something and what happens if you take that grammar away. And so there's a lot to be afraid of with chat GPT. But one thing that's going to be great, I think, is that we're going to see more interest in the humanities. And in particular, my prediction mm -hmm. is that we're going to actually see an increase in enrollment in humanities courses across uh, at least American universities. I won't pretend to know how other university systems work. So spring semester, summer term, if there is one, fall semester next year, I think we can look for statistically significant differences of more people enrolled in humanities courses across universities. That's my what? prediction slash hope. I like this. I like that. It's it's a very aspirational prediction. That, it uh, is much, but, yeah. but it's a good yeah. one. Chat GPT will, will increase humanities enrollment. Uh, what do we think? I can't argue with this at all. I love this idea. As somebody who's a science background with humanity, love of humanities, like my life is better because I I studied both things, right? And I and I think I think that this is a an, a really really exciting take on something that I felt kind of grim about. So thanks, Andrea. 
<laughs> I might be delusional. Let's. Uh, <laughs> I'm coming to you at the end of a semester of you know students who never want to do anything but write computer code, and you're just like, but I think you have to be do both. And you know, so I'm I'm living in the extreme tales of nervous students who want to stick with data science, and so I might be just doubly reacting to that in Chat GPT. But I, I, I think that there's something there. You know, I've never seen more computer scientists reading long pieces of text <laughs> until very recently. It kind of forces them to do it. I think that's yeah. the interesting part of this. Yeah. 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 I really hope you're right on this because I was thinking the same thing that if you, you know, chat GPT can be wrong. So you have to review everything so carefully. So even if you right. don't want to do a secondary or tertiary thing related to it, you're like, is this actually right? So you actually right. are reviewing and editing in a different way than you normally would. So it actually might remove some pain points, might make people learn. Yes. No, I is I, I absolutely I read a point similar to that, that I, I uh, not my own, but but I was very excited and, and helped me get to my prediction, which was, you know, maybe we we see students who aren't taking classes that are history, literature and so on, because you have this idea that you have to write a big paper at the end and no one wants to write papers. I don't want to write papers. No one does. And so if you have an idea that writing the paper itself is actually going to be made easier because at least a rough draft can be given to you. I think it will still be a lot of work and maybe even more work in the end. Like if you ever try to like rejigger someone's code instead of writing your own, sometimes it's faster and sometimes it just ends up taking way longer because you're trying to make sense of what someone else has done. I think that it will be make a perceived barrier to entry for taking these courses and enjoying them. Uh, I think they will make that barrier to entry lower and therefore more people might take it who might otherwise be interested but dissuaded because of the essay side of things. I almost made like responsible AI frameworks. One of my, I'm not, that's not the prediction I'm making, but this fits right okay. in with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, prediction number two, Andrea, what do you got? All right. Well, I'm glad you said responsible AI frameworks and uh, we've talked about this on the show. So maybe that's why it's on my mind, but this is, I will link the, the Twitter conversation with responsible AI in that I think the, the mess that's been going on with Twitter is going to be one of the biggest drivers to my actual prediction, which is we're going to see a passage of the, uh, ex I forget the exact congressional, the algorithmic, tra uh, shoot, what's the name of the bill? There's a uh, accountability the, the algorithmic Act? accountability act of 2022. I was like, I'm sure there's legislation out there. So there's the algorithmic accountability act of 2022. It's uh, been brought up in Congress. It's been proposed. It hasn't gone through any other steps. My concrete prediction is that that or some version of it will be passed in 2023. And I am arguing that Twitter and the mess that it's created will actually propel it to be more likely to happen this coming year than in future years. Because as we were talking about with Sarah's prediction, we all experienced how much a change in an algorithm or even a change in one person who then changes the people who change the algorithm has impacted our lives. And I think it's a moment of like, we're all, this is water. We just live in algorithms. We don't really, yeah, they affect our lives. We don't really see it. Whereas we all kind of got to see a mini, not a counterfactual, but another, we're living in what is kind of a parallel reality with a different person at the helm. And I don't know about you all, but I am seeing differences in my timeline, right? Like I'm seeing different K things are being promoted. People I used to follow, obviously some are leaving, but they're being not as promoted. And I think we're experiencing how much of an effect the algorithms have on us because we've just been given this like big moment of change. Hmm. And I think feeling that has started to make me and more importantly, lots and lots of people question, hang on, well, what if one other person just flipped a different switch at YouTube? What if someone changed something big at Instagram? And yes, these algorithms evolve all the time and there are little changes and we move towards reels and people complain or they take it back or whatever. But I think this big kind of like punctuated equilibrium moment where it's like, the before Twitter and the after Twitter and how much of an impact these algorithms have on literally the world that we are experiencing, the news that we're given, the perspectives that we're put in front of. I think that seismic shift is gonna spur more people into action and support for algorithmic accountability in Congress. I don't know that those bills are gonna do anything, my prediction is just that we'll see some legislation. <laughs> you you got to where I was going, which is like, I think you're right that everyone being upset about something will cause a bill to be passed, whether it has That's any effect or not. Totally, yeah. totally different thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it, living in a post-algorithm world over on Mastodon has been really fascinating, right? Because people are coming in, they're like, wait, how do you find stuff? Oh, oh, I have to wait for somebody to boost it into my timeline. How do I find people to follow? You follow hashtags and you do all the things that we used to do in the pre-algorithmic timeline version of Twitter. And it's just it's just incredibly foreign at this point. So yeah, I, I, I want, I, I, I'm all for algorithmic accountability, whether it comes in the form of an act or um, you know, something that actually works. 
<laughs> I mean, the other version of this, I was trying to think about what's the measurable version, uh, maybe more impactful, but kind potentially harder to measure version of my prediction or, or manifestation of my prediction is we may see the big tech companies, and some are already doing this, we may see the big tech companies start to post big websites or big pages where they actually walk through how the algorithm works. Now, I realize that mm -hmm. A, just knowing that doesn't tell you what the output's going to be. Just looking at a bunch of code, I think, wouldn't be sufficient. You'd have to talk about, like, what are my decisions around? What am I training on? What am I testing on? Why this? I don't know that a lot of people are going to bother to read those. I don't even know that that's something that companies would be open to doing for, you know, privacy. The, the algorithm is the product that they're making money on at the end of the day. Uh, but my my other idea, apart from legislation, was like, you know, maybe the 10 biggest tech companies, you'll start to see like YouTube is like, hey, here's a, like, a high level how the algorithm works. I, I don't know. That would also put a lot of people whose job it is to say, here's how to tackle the TikTok algorithm like out of business. So maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, although I look at it like security. Open open source uh, yeah. programs are more secure because more eyes are on them. Uh, yeah. So so maybe that algorithm will be more secure with more eyes on them. But it's a different situation when you're talking about gaming an algorithm where even if you let people know what the algorithm is, sometimes the people who make the algorithm don't even know why it works the way it does. Well, so exactly. I'm not sure how helpful this ends up being. But that doesn't mean your prediction won't come to fruition. Right. Well, you know, I, I really am, must be down on algorithms because I'm like, I don't think the, the, the transparency about the algorithm itself is going to help us, but Congress might. Like, that's a delusion that I'm living <laughs> oh, in. If yeah, I I'm, think I'm, that you lose the me there, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other thoughts on Andrea's prediction? I think that the threat of litigation, I have not litigation, of legislation, I didn't legislation. read the actual, I didn't look at mm -hmm. the actual text of this Accountability Act yet, um, but I would think that the threat of it would cause a consortium to, consortium to exist within the big companies going, we're going to regulate ourselves because we actually know what we're talking about. At least we have the, we can show you that we have an idea what this is because every single time I've covered a congressional hearing yeah. regarding technology, it has been... It's not gone well. Let's go with that anyway. It's it's just been a bunch of befuddled people who have no idea how technology works, and I I fear for what they might unintentionally put in these bills because they mm. don't understand what they're talking about. So I think it might force a self regulation, mm. just because that would be it would be a good PR move from the the big companies. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't regulate us. We'll regulate ourselves. Is a common common response for sure. All right, let's move on to you, Will Smith. Put your put your money where your antlers are. What's your first prediction for 2023? Well, so I think that Apple knocked something loose when they did the do not track flag on phones a couple of years. It seems like forever ago, but it's probably been like nine months or a year or something at this point. Um, you know, we saw what it did to Google and Apple and and Facebook's valuations in terms of you know how it how it's impacted their ad revenue. But I think more importantly than the revenue side, it's it's made people focus on privacy in a way that you know twenty years of Cory Doctorow yelling about people being tracked on the internet hasn't hasn't had an impact. The idea that every time you open an app, it says, "Hey, I don't want to be tracked," uh, is is an important. It has has people that don't normally think about this kind of stuff talking about privacy. I get questions about privacy from 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 you know, my parents' friends and stuff like that at this point, which is which has been an interesting conversation to have. Um, I I think that along with that, you know, I've been working on the FOSPod for a year now, which is a we we talk to people who create free and open source software uh, at all different kind of stages on the life cycle of that. And we've and one of the things I've noticed along uh, as part of that that podcast is that. There's this. There's a moment in a lot of popular open source software where there's an inflection point where the number of users, you know, skyrockets, and as a result of the number of people who are contributing to the code skyrockets, and then all of a sudden the the kind of scrappy underdog open source software becomes the market leader in a in a segment, and it's a it's a really exciting moment for these projects. How they like the podcast is about how they transition through that moment a lot of times, um, and, and I think that those two things are combining to you know the the privacy focus is pushing more people toward open source software um because they the perception is that open source is, is it's better to work with an open source software than have adobe or google or amazon or facebook tracking tracking your your work and, and how you're how you're participating you know in the internets um and at the same time those small projects are becoming really good you know tools everything from like blender and inkscape for content creation or audacity to um running home assistant on a cheap raspberry pi versus buying something from samsung or google to do your home automation work you know the the, the tools are getting really really good and i think that those two lines are going to intersect those two trends are going to intersect and we're going to see uh, a really a much wider uh interest in adoption of open source software in the next year but i don't 
that the asterisk is i don't think it's going to be the year of linux desktop though, so. i was gonna, you Sorry, stole nerd. my joke i was going to make you answer that yeah no it's absolutely not, not. not not the year of linux on so that's your prediction this is not the year of linux on the desktop <laughs> yeah, it's a total cop-out <laughs> prediction i'm saying that 2023 will not be the year of linux on the desktop yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, but but you you think we'll see a measurable increase in adoption of open source that's interesting. I mean, we're we're already seeing it in like blender is is mm -hmm. the use of blender in the games industry is kind of going through the roof this year people people are looking at it as hey it's a it's a you know the tools that it competes with are phenomenally expensive but it's also kind of the swiss army knife and people are learning how to use blender in school in art school now and and um it's opened the doors to a lot of a lot of potential artists that maybe didn't have access to those tools uh previously that's a good one any any thoughts on will's prediction I hope he's right because that's another one. Like yeah, you should, you should get a lot more, a lot more eyes on it. We talked about it before. A lot more eyes on the actual code. You know what's going on. Things get fixed when things are gone, gone wrong. You know about it right away. Like there's very little downside to it, unless somebody actually takes that open source software and closes it up later and calls it something else. You know, like the XBMC thing that happened a long time ago. Right, or or some kind of unintended secondary use, but I like to think that that's going to happen. People are going to do nasty stuff with code no matter what, and I don't know that keeping things, uh, you know, helpful tools on, on the internet that are open source, that that's necessarily going to drive it. No, I think it's good. I'm excited that there's a, another positive prediction. I One thing I would want to know, and I realize this isn't part of your prediction, is what who are going to be the people using and, and making available these open, open source tools? And in particular, uh, as I've sort of tipped my hand on this, I'm very interested in getting people who are currently maybe not not technophobic, but techno hesitant or or feel like they're not uh, coders or can't get involved. I would love to see not just more people using open source code who already have uh, access to or awareness of these tools, but taking more advantage of them, but also maybe inviting in, uh, just like Will was saying, like artists and, and other people who don't typically use or interact with, um, you know, technology in that way. I would be really excited if it goes that far. All right, let's uh, move on to your second prediction. Will, what do you got for us? Okay, so the second thing is I've I've been thinking a lot about computational photography, which is the idea that you know your your modern smartphone has this kind of crappy image sensor on it. It's a small sensor. It's a small piece of glass. And typically, you know, with photography, the you, you want a bigger piece of glass and a bigger sensor. But somehow, Apple and Google and Samsung and all the people making smartphones are now creating these unbelievable photos out of these tiny little sensors by combining multiple sensors and doing a bunch of really smart compute work around that. And I think that that idea of, of compute plus an existing endemic market is you know, probably it's decimated the photo market, the the the, de the dedicated photo uh, camera market. I think that there's probably other markets that that's going to come into, and somebody's 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 got to be working on this right now. So my prediction is that someone will add. I, I think home audio is probably the obvious one. Ah. Uh -huh. Um. So I think that someone's going to add compute to the home audio audio category and just absolutely demolish the endemic players. Um. We, you know, we see if you look at you know. Um, uh, Sarah's Alexa or the Google, the you know the little Google set speaker pucks or home Google bots home, or whatever, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah whatever you have, they yeah, have everything in them that you need combined with a smartphone to map out the room and know where they are in the room. You, you know, they have microphones, they have directional speakers. Presumably, we could build a really impressive sound field with a depth camera on your phone by scanning your room, letting it know where the where the speakers are. And then you know use the magic of 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 massive massively available edge compute to make those tiny fifty dollar kind of crappy speakers sound like something that's get you know going to make the the five foot tall clipshes in my living room sound like they're for babies. So so that's my <laughs> prediction is uh, is computational uh, computational audio uh, is going to be a big thing next year. Oh man, I hope it is. I really do. I and I think really the the biggest barrier are people being like, well, that's too much information. You know, I don't want to tell people how my home is set up because you get that all the time, right? And it it that is that is valid and that's fair. But uh, if you are willing to to you know sort of get on board with, hey, let's make these speakers, uh, this audio experience, to be the best possible based on where you are right now. You know, and how sound is bouncing off that 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 is that is a that's that would be a big win for audio enthusiasts, if not everybody. 
the the thing that I think they're like Amazon has a problem with this because there's a lot 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 of lack of consumer trust for Amazon and Facebook and yeah. and to a lesser extent I think Google but I think Apple could get away with this I think Sonos could get away with this I think somebody like I, in a perfect world there's somebody in their garage right now replacing the motherboards in your little Google speaker pucks with their own hardware and their own software and and just building you know drafting on the on the billion dollar investment these big corporations have done to make these cool homebrew speakers I I don't think that's actually happening. But in my heart of hearts, I wish it was. I mean, it's well, probably happening. Whether or not it's going to reach the consumer market is something else. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I one of the reasons I don't have home anything is I'm paranoid and also a Luddite, but uh, paranoid. But I do have Sonos speakers, and I'm sure I've told them all kinds of things about my home already without realizing it. So, uh, And it's great. <laughs> it's a vast improvement. So I, I hope you're right. Yeah, it can come from a trusted brand. It could do a lot to prove that it's all on device. You don't go to the cloud for that sort of thing. Ayaz, any other thoughts on this one? I think I'm going to echo everything everybody else said. I want this to be true because audio, I have way too many speakers and they could be way better. And the other thing is they don't actually have to be better. I just need to hear them in a, in a different way. Maybe they don't need to be projecting mm. every which way. It's just like, mm -hmm. we're going to get to you. We know you're sitting there right now. So that I want to be true, but I don't have high hopes because I, I think I if Will's it. wrong, it's because he's too early. Like it may just may not happen next year, but I think you will eventually be right about this. It makes perfect sense. People dismissed the idea that you could replace those big complex lenses with something in a smartphone and then look what happened. So uh, yeah, if it doesn't happen next year, I still think you're probably going to be right down the road. Fingers crossed. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I just want to make all these little speakers sound good, please. And I they think it's totally possible, now. totally yeah. possible. In fact, yeah. now it will happen because somebody's listening to this and is like, hey, wait a minute, I have an idea. I'm going to do that now. You just incepted them. Yeah. And if you have, uh, send us an email. We'd love to hear about your new idea and uh, know about it before everybody else. Or if you have a prediction yourself, you're like, here's the prediction y'all didn't make. I'm going to send it to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We would love to hear them. All right. Coming into the home stretch. I as Actar, what is going to happen in 2023 in technology? Well, I didn't think anywhere near as big as as you guys did, so that that's great. Um, so I'm going to give you like the the tamest predictions that are probably going to happen. The first one is something really simple, and it's been denied forever. Mac OS is going to run on an iPad in 2023. It's going to be official. It's I mean, gonna you happen. could do it already, but you're saying it's going to be it's, official. Okay, it's going to be something like a, that Apple will, yeah. At WWDC, champion. they're going to be like, look, you can run it. We just had to figure out the best, perfect way for it to run on an iPad, and now it does. They already share the same system on a chip. They already have the spacing all set up in the new version of, of Mac OS. Everything got spaced out. There's so much overlap at this point. iPad apps, iOS apps also run on, uh, on my Mac Mini right now, the M1 mm -hmm. Mac Mini, super old. It's just... We're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. So I think we're finally going to get it in 2023. Craig Federighi is going to be so excited to show it to us. It's going to be okay because there needs to be a reason why the iPad Pro and the MacBook Pro, like how do these things coexist? And they got to figure this out. So I think we're going to have Mac OS on an now, iPad. It, will it replace iPad OS or will it be like a boot camp situation? No, I, think, I think it'll be an app. As in, like, ah, you open okay. up Mac OS 10 oh, or not OS 10. Yeah, Mac that feels OS. very Apple-y, you're right. Right, so, like, when you dock it, it acts like a desktop. So, basically, look, here's, here's, oh, you really want to think about how this is going to work. Think of what, about how Windows 8 was supposed to work, and this is how it's actually going to work. It's like, oh, you dock it. Now it knows. <laughs> it's a computer now. Oh, it, now you have a touch. Now it's going to be iPad first. It's going to, mm. it's going to be one of those smart devices that figure out how you use it, when you need to use it. Oh, you're docked with a laptop, with a, with a, uh, with a keyboard now it's more like a pc like it's it's gonna do that because apple's gonna just copy windows 8 and do it right this is a fascinating idea to me right like of all the like i think i think if anything you're probably like five years too early because what they'll do is they'll they have this running right now in cupertino right like you could go into the mothership, yeah. mothership right now and and this is how federi uses his his ipad right, right. now but but they're gonna wait until nobody wants this feature anymore, and it completely doesn't matter before they actually roll it out. <laughs> and then they'll make a big fuss about it and how great oh, yeah. it is. Oh, yeah. huge. whenever it happens, that's gonna happen for sure. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. oh, interesting. Is it gonna go as far as I imagine not? But I would kind of just for fun like to see it on my phone as well. But if it works for an iPad, it should work for a phone, right? For the most part, uh, they, they keep they still keep those things separate, which is still strange. 
there's certain multitasking yeah. things you can't do on an, on an iPhone, even though they got huge. So I don't yeah. see, unless they, they make Mac OS an app, just like I was talking about, you dock a phone and it does it. That would be, that's, they've had patents for that in the past where you could basically dock a phone, make it a laptop. So could do it. That's not my prediction right now. I don't think Fold, an iPhone is going right. to do that. Foldable, in your mouth. foldable iPhone. Mm. That runs iPad OS and then could do this. That might be your entry point to the phone. Because the A chip, the phones with the A chip won't do this, but a foldable would have an M chip in it, presumably. Possibly anyway. I mean, 10 years out is the convergence, and I know people have talked about this forever, but the convergence of iPads, laptops, and phones. There it's just all one medium size block. And I agree, yeah, folding. Yeah. Right? Why do we have all these separate devices? Doesn't make any sense. Ten years out, it's going to be Neuralink all the way. That's okay. that's, uh, yeah, that's right. clearly where we're going. I mean, I'm first in line. Yeah. It's going great right. so far. Everything. Okay, touched, perfect. So. That's what the antlers are about. Now I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They just hide it, the plugs. It's the antenna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, Ias. Speaking of foldables, what's your second prediction? Well, yeah, there it is. Uh, I wasn't tipping a hand on that one, but we'll get the Google Foldable. This has been rumored forever. Mm. Android Array supports foldables. Google and Samsung, they're buddies at this point. Samsung essentially fixed Wear OS. They're like, hey, uh, Google's like, we give up. So the way Google and Samsung have been working together so closely over the past couple of years, if they've got any questions, they can talk to Samsung. Also, Sam, uh, Google got back into the tablet space after leaving it because that's what they do. That Pixel tablet is, I think I saw a while ago, there was somebody's actually selling it before it came out. So it's kind of strange. But the idea that this, this foldable tablet, when you open it up, it's an actual Android tablet and they actually know how to use one finally because Samsung figured it out. And you close it up, it's a phone. That's I think this is the time because Google's saying, okay, tablets make sense, foldables make sense. And yeah, we can have that almost everything device because foldables are not a new category. They don't need to do any of that, like they don't need to do all the focus groups and stuff. They have years and years of their partners' research that they can pour over. I almost called the year of the foldable, that this is the year foldables, we get our mid-range foldable. Do you think Google comes out with the mid-range foldable? Like, that was you know my initial one. I was like, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a Samsung was going to come out with like a six hundred dollar one. I'm like, no, nah, it's not. Uh, going to happen. Uh, I just okay. don't see that right. happening yet because not yet. too want, early. The bigger screen, maybe the flip would be the cheap one, but that's another yeah. thing. But I think Google's got to enter the space to show its partners as well. Hey, yeah, you guys keep doing this because we're doing it. So please do it too. Yeah, and you'll you'll need that to happen before the mid-range foldable, and you need the mid-range foldable before the Apple foldable. That'll be really expensive. Exactly, and it'll be the best foldable. That's like six years from now. Yeah, I'm looking for the foldable watch. I just want to just get up on my wrist and just keep cranking watch. it out, like you know, have yeah. a full thing down the side of my arm. That's that's the future I want to live in. That's kind. Of, I had not thought about. I want it that. to just be a whole shirt that I'm wearing that I just <laughs> watch shirts. <laughs> yeah, and when you take it off, you fold it. Yeah, and put it away. Right, Marie Kondo. Yeah. If I Apple right. shirt watch. Yeah. yeah, it's like a snap bracelet, but a shirt. Yeah, <laughs> you just, just arms out, smack it on. Yeah. I do, I do love that idea, though. I, I know we're we're getting a little ahead of ourselves from my guess's <laughs> prediction, but no, this is the fun. idea of like a foldable something that could be a phone or a watch mm. or a wearable in some other capacity, foldable and stretchable. At the yeah. Same time. yeah, like a like a pocket square that's also your computer mm -hmm. and your laptop and your right yeah. things that people Ooh. do already. Let's right. make it tech. Very diamond age. <laughs> yes. Let's check in in, uh, sh what, what should we say, 10 years about the foldable clothing or 20 and see how we did on those. <laughs> yeah, I think we yeah. can check in at 10 and then we'll be right in 20. Yeah. Good, yeah. right. Yeah. All We're right, all any around. other thoughts on Ayaz's prediction? Good right. ones. Yeah, yeah I like it. all fold. Yeah, all fold right. it up. I have decided after years of either being too early on a prediction or just plain wrong uh, that I am going to give up sensible predictions this year uh, and I'm just going to make ridiculous predictions uh, with the hope that I am accidentally right by being so crazy. So my first one is that Twitter will be sold by the end of 2023. Musk will retain a stake and I want full credit if it's sold. But for bonus points, I'm going to call Salesforce as the company that buys it. Now, why is this so outlandish, Tom? I mean, I think this is probably. <laughs> Haven't you seen the Twitter like, poll? Almost a safe, safe prediction, really. Yeah. 
No, I mean, g- every, given the why, fact that why? you know we're 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 just rolling into 2023 in a couple of weeks, we got some have, time. He, the idea is that he's he's degraded the value. He couldn't possibly sell it. He's going to have to go mm-hmm. bankrupt. I'm not saying everyone I see is saying bankruptcy, and then yeah, then maybe it gets sold. I'm saying that he's going to have new. It's going to have new ownership by the end of the year, not bankrupt. Like it's going to be a a value play, and Musk is going to deal it out, and keep a stake, so he gets his money back later. But he's not even going to want to own it anymore. So he's going to sell it at a huge loss just to sell it. I don't know that he'll sell it at a loss because he's going to keep a stake, but he's going to be able to satisfy his investors that they're either getting their money back or keeping a stake uh, while handing over the problem to somebody else. He's completely devalued the service, though, as it is by in, in like he's, he's, we're six weeks in at the time we record this. I think that's perception, not reality. I think he's got. I think he'll have numbers. That he can point to and say, look, if uh, if you're there not pissing off advertisers, look at these numbers. You'll be able to sell all these ads. This is a valuable property. He does point to the increased Twitter activity overall, but yeah. I think it's because we all want to jump on the ship and watch it sink from the inside. But maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, when you had written this down in the notes, Tom, honestly, I thought you meant it would have new ownership by the end of 2022, not by the end of 2023. <laughs> well, so, we do I, record I, I, these I, early. So if yeah. I'm right, I still get credit for it, <laughs> even if it's 20. No, but I, I really don't. I, I think it'll, I think I actually, my instinct tells me that this isn't going to happen. He's not going to sell it. So that's why I consider it an outlandish proposition to say he'll sell it and everybody thought salesforce was going to buy it salesforce keeps acting like man that twitter boy that sure is cool we sure do still love the twitter i feel and that's why i call salesforce as the most likely company to just buddy up with him and say elon this is a headache for you just let us take it off your hands you can keep a stake everybody will be happy we'll just take it over it's going to be fine i wish salesforce would take some stuff off my plate that would be nice. I don't have anything uh, remotely as interesting as Twitter, but if Salesforce, if you're listening, email me. I'll I'll share. I'll sell you whatever I'm working on. You can have it. Yeah, I don't know. I, th- I think Salesforce might have a volatile year itself in 2023. Yeah. Wow, I, you know, which is a different conversation. That would altogether. make my prediction also ridiculous. Is that it, <laughs> Salesforce isn't distracted by its own issues <laughs> and is able to do this? So there's another aspect of this for sure. Tom, mm-hmm. uh, all right, I, so. Th- yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. I, I I think if you had said Matt Mullenweg would buy this for $4 million by the end of the year, I probably would have bought in. I would that was too, like, too, too much wish fulfillment for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, cause I, I do like Mullenweg and I think he's, I think he's a good CEO. Uh, I know he's also probably overvalued amongst the internet cognoscenti, but I think it's for a reason. I think, I think he's good at what he does. I think he's shown that. Yeah. All right. I see that that was not silly enough for you. <laughs> So how about this one? Uh, We've seen vinyl make a comeback. We've seen cassettes make a comeback. I predict in 2023, floppy disks will make a nostalgia comeback. Uh, Kids will want to buy software on the save icon. Really? You can, you can do that. (laughs) There'll be uh, nostalgia floppy drives on USB C that you can plug in to play your nostalgia floppy disk software. It'll be a whole like cottage industry akin to the miniature, you know, Nintendo entertainment system, miniature Atari 2600. Or uh, vinyl. Yeah. And uh, combined with vinyl and cassettes, boutique floppy disk nostalgia comeback. For clarity's sake, are these 1.44 megabyte discs? Or are you talking about like the the five the really big floppy ones, the five point five inch question. one? Or are you talking about the same capacity? What, what are we talking about? I'm talking about three and a half inch discs, probably. But mm-hmm. I'm not going to limit it. If the five and a quarters make a comeback, I'm still taking credit for this. So and capacity way. wise, yeah. we're staying in the kilo, kilobytes to megabytes. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be just like cassettes and vinyl. Like this okay. is for novelty's sake. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like what you could even store on one of those those big ones, like the actual floppy ones. I'm really excited. I, I hope this comes true. I, I frankly, be, I have a whole bunch be, of my grandmother's discs <laughs> that I can't it, play. It'll be reissues of old software. Okay. So it'll be like, you know, Civilization One and uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the first one, and Sim City and all that kind of stuff. Oregon Trail. Yeah. Yeah. My first question was going to be okay, floppy disks, I, I can see, but like, 
how would you use them? But yeah, if there's a cottage industry mm -hmm. of hardware that allows you to use them and it's kind of like a fun enthusiast thing, probably, you know, largely between like parents and kids being like, see, this is how we used to do this. It's fun, right? I can, I totally see that. It goes with the whole it. 90s era Y2K nostalgia wave. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think there's going to be people building synths out of floppy disks. I think I think you're you're not you need to go one step further, and people are going to take you know mic up the motors and and you know hook them up so you can play them with with like MIDI keyboards and you can control them <laughs> like that, like a full on synth. Make that good clickety clackety. Do, I like do, this. Do, do, yeah, do, take do, do, this. Yeah, Run with it. Like, I it, love make it. Make it happen. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I love what we're like. Let's get rid of like the cylinders in our homes and shrink the speakers and all that, but also fill our homes with devices to play. Uh, <laughs> huge old fashioned technology. I'm well, right. It's a, it's like oh, we got it. we got rid of the bulky entertainment center, and we can listen to everything on our phone. But now yeah. we're also going to buy a, a record player. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It sounds like the slow cooking movement. Like you know, you know how long it took to do anything with floppy disks. It's like okay, I want this. I remember buying. I got the Windows ninety five upgrade. I think it was like 13 disks, but they were specially formatted. So they were larger than one point four four megabytes. So I'm just thinking like. The hours and hours and hours and okay, hitting okay, all right. So hit the next disc, <laughs> yeah. hitting okay. Let's start to make a clicking sound. <laughs> uh oh, yeah. Take it out. Okay. And then like you know, two or three hours later, you have your upgraded version of your software in a virtual machine somewhere. So I mean, the idea of hey son, take a look at how it used to be. You'd be like, I'm out. I'm not watching this. This is Except like two hours. Except going to be so much faster. Because it's all going to be running on modern machine machines. They're gonna, they're going to have to have like virtual software that slows things down to make it feel like it's real. I, I mean, sillier things have happened. I love it. It's a lot of work to get where we started. Like we could have just had not had the technology of the last thirty years. And I'm just, uh, I'm just saying, I love if it. any if anyone had predicted cassettes would make a comeback three years ago, I would have thought they were ridiculous. So I'm just I'm going with it. You know. Yep. No, I have friends yep. who carry around just huge you know, binders of cassettes, just like we used to in the nineties and they carry yeah. them around now. So yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Just, just buy your USB drives now. Yeah. <laughs> I want a USB C floppy disk drive. I I think that's really at root of what, what this prediction is about. Like, There's I, probably one already. Th yeah. There. They're there. Yeah. I just want the ridiculousness yeah. of that to be justified. We just, we need to make it a thing. That's, yes. By the time that's, we review these predictions a year from now, I want your shelves behind you, Tom, to have nothing but USB-C <laughs> floppy disk drives. <laughs> <laughs> I, but there's so many other things he has behind him. There are a lot of I was just looking to see if I had any floppy drives within reach, but I only have CD-ROMs, so oh nice. well. Well, uh, while Tom is is looking for those, uh, you know, thanks to everybody who helped us with our uh, 2023 tech predictions. A lot of good stuff. Uh, I feel like mine were the worst, but you never know. That's the fun of this. And a year from today, we'll all come back and talk about who was right, who was wrong, and who got 25% right and, and the like. Uh, but thanks to everybody who participated. Andrea, we'll start with you. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with the rest that you do. Sure. You can find me on the various social medias at Jonesroy, J-O-N-E-S-R-O-O-Y. Will you be able to find me on Twitter versus Mastodon versus Post versus the others a year from now? Who knows? Let's see if Sarah was right. Uh, otherwise, I'm at jonesroy.com and my podcast is called Majoring and Everything and it's on all the things. Good stuff. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of cool and retro to have your own URL these days. There you, you know? go. Just, yeah, yeah. You know, thank you. Just, just yeah. I just... print it out onto my floppy disk so I can hand it to you if you want. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine too. Glad yeah. that I uh, that I re-upped uh, my uh, subscription for my own uh, website. Will Smith, also great to have you as well. Good predictions. Let's see how you do a year from now. But until then, let folks know where they can find you. Thanks, Sarah. You can find me on uh, Brad Will Made a Tech Pod and the Foss Pod, which are where all fine podcasts are downloaded. Uh, or you can just go to techpod.content.town and find good links to everything there. Well, we're so glad to have you on the show. And of course, I as Akhtar, we've done this. <laughs> we've done this a few times before, but so nice to have you. Uh, for the end of 2022, talking about predictions for 2023. In the meantime, where can people find you? Uh, go to thisoldnerd.com. It's a show I do where I show you how to have the most tech forward home and life as possible. The project is short because your life is short. And uh, I don't know what I'll be tackling in 2023. Probably some AI or computational audio. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe it's my turn. Yeah. Why not? Do it. 
Uh, also uh, doing it for us is our patrons. Uh, it, patrons, this is the final show for DTNS in 2022. So thank you so much for all of you who support us and have for so long. We hope you stay with us for a long time to come. Could not do this show without your help. That is the understatement of the year. Just a reminder, we're not live during the holiday break, taking some time off to hang out with family and friends, but we do return to live shows on Tuesday, January 3rd. You can find the details at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. But we are back Monday in the new year with our best of GDI for 2022. It rolls on. Talk to you then. Happy New Year! This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>